about human nature, uh, you know, one thing that, that probably is very true is that for the most part we, we need focus, we need a, a cause, we need something to rally around, you know, a, a moment that we can remember to draw strength from, you know, to encourage us forward. I mean, think back to, to the Mexican-American War, you know, they had the war, the cry, remember the Alamo, something to rally around. Sports teams, you know, the, the coach will give a speech, you know, and remember, you know, let's win one for the Gipper. For a Christian, our rallying point comes at the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In a few moments, uh, we are going to partake in communion, a sacrament which Christ left us in, in remembrance of him, in remembrance of his sacrificial death on the cross. Communion is a rallying point for us. It's a place that God calls us to often to remember there's a reason, there's a, there's a purpose for it. I want to talk about it for just a little bit. Now, communion is divided into two separate parts, which zero in on two separate actions of, of, of Christ's death, and, and they are distinct. First of all, we are told to take up the bread, the bread which is a symbol of the, the body of Jesus Christ, his body that is given for you, given for us. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says this, Speaking of Jesus, says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. It's not just the, the idea that Jesus went to the cross, you know, for your sins, but literally, your sins, whatever you did yesterday, Whatever you did this past week, whatever you did this past month, this past year, anything in your past, anything in your future, your sins, they all came bearing down on the body of Jesus Christ as he hung upon the cross, in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins. As Jesus died, that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. As the body, as the flesh of Jesus Christ as it hung on the cross, it held within itself the sins of you and I. I mean, all the sins we've committed, all the sins that we were out will ever commit on God, God the Son, Jesus Christ. And as the body of Christ was slain for you, it performed a very special action on our part, the giving of the body, the physical physical fleshly body of Jesus Christ that took your sins, that took my sins, it performs something very special, him giving his body. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 and verse 14, it says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. For by one offering, verse 14 says, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now use that, that fancy biblical word, sanctify. And, and it sounds so rich, but then, oh, what does it mean? It means to be made holy. Through the Christ taking my sins in his body, and his body dying, he sanctified me, he made me holy, he purified me. Now you might say, well, you know, why, why do I need to be sanctified? Why do I need to be made, you know, holy or, or perfected? You know, I understand that God needs that. He's God. But why do I need to be holy? Why is that so important for me? Well, think about this. You know, it is only that which is holy, that which is sanctified, that ever comes into the presence of God. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, if you think back to the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 21, God is recording the, the holy life his priests are supposed to have. He was telling the, the priests what they were supposed to touch or not touch, and how they were supposed to be cleansed, and how they were supposed to purify themselves. Well, why did the priests need such a holy life? Well, it says in verse 8, 
He says, Thou shalt sanctify them, him therefore, for he offereth the bread of thy God. He shall be holy unto thee, for I, the Lord, which sanctify you, am holy. Be holy because I am holy. So those priests, those men, they would take the bread of God, the offering given to God. They were going behind that curtain to the holiest of holy, the place that only the high priests were allowed to go. And they would take that sacrifice for the people. And, and, and when they entered in behind that holy place, they themselves need to be purified. They needed to be holy. Now we're told from history that when they went into the holiest of holies, that they would actually tie a rope around the priests. And um, as he went in, and they actually also had a bell on their cloak. So they could hear him behind them moving around, and the bell tinkled, and, you know, they, they hear him moving around. And they had that rope there, because if the priest entered into the holiest of holies, the, the presence of God, if he entered it, and he wasn't purified, or if the, the sacrifice that he brought wasn't purified, an unblemished lamb, he would be struck dead right on the spot. How did he go in and get him? Oh, well, they pull him out with a rope. It's a visual. The people understood the need that we have, that we do not come into the presence of God unless we are holy, unless we are, are cleansed. And when Christ took upon his body your sins, when he took upon his body my sins, God was taking the steps whereby we might enter into his presence. He sanctified us. He made us holy. Now also in communion, we're first told to take of the bread, the body of Christ. But we're also told to take the cup which calls us to remember the blood of Jesus Christ that is shed for us. It too, just like the body, it performed a special action on our part. They're not just one big thing. They're distinct what was happening on the cross. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Since we have been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? So understand that we are sanctified through Christ's body. We are justified through Christ's blood. Now I know I've, I've, I've you know, mentioned this before, and people hear the definition of justified. What does it mean? Is you know, and there's that little rhyme, justified, just as if I'd never sinned. And yeah, you know, that has a little bit of a sense of the truth there, but but it really means to render innocent. It's not like I never sinned. It's like, I sinned, but I have been declared free from the penalty, from, from the punishment of sin. I mean, very literally, we have been put on trial. All our sins are being read to prove our guilt and to sentence us to death. And each charge against me, every sin that I've ever committed is, it is read, the only thing that I can do. And he says, what's your, what's your plea to this charge? Is to say, guilty. I'm guilty, I have sinned, I have sinned. But by Christ's blood shed for you, God says, innocent. Innocent. So I don't come not as one who I've never done any wrong, but I come as one who has been declared innocent from the penalty for the wrongs, the sins which I've committed. So as we partake of communion, we're supposed to remember the broken body of Christ, battered, beaten. That body was given to sanctify your body, to allow us to come into the presence of God. As we partake of communion, we're supposed to remember the shed blood of Jesus Christ that justified you, justified me from my sins, declared me innocent. Now understanding this, it is, that, is it any wonder that we are given this solemn warning that goes along with communion? A warning in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you know, that, that, that tells us how we are supposed to approach and how we're supposed to rally and remember the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. If you have a chance, go ahead if you'd like to. And go ahead and turn to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me just read a couple of verses here. From, I'll start in verse 17 while you're turning there. It says, but in giving this instruction, Paul is writing here to the Corinthian church 
You know, this is literally a church gathering of believers, just similar to us. They didn't have buildings like this, but they were, they were believers, none of the sense, gathered together at church. It says, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. They go, whoa, what's that talking about here? Well, Paul is about to list, from here on out for the next few chapters, he's about to list a, a number of functions within the church that within the Corinthian church were being misused. You know, he's going to talk about community. He's going to talk about spiritual gifts. He's going to talk about the unity in the body. He's going to talk about love and, and how they, the, the Corinthians had distorted <laughs> these things. Well, in their misuse of the Lord's Supper, we find that the, literally the way that they were practicing it, the heart, the attitude they went into it, was, was literally a mockery to what communion was supposed to be. It says down in verse 20, he says, Therefore, when you meet together, is it not to eat it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or you, do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. You see, as the Corinthian church was coming together to, to remember, to rally around the crucifixion, um, you know, it, it got gotten all out of whack for them. I mean, they, they observed it differently than, than we do today. And again, the Lord, the Lord doesn't say here, this is how you have to observe communion. You, you know, he does focus on the body, the bread, the, the blood, the drink. But, you know, other than that, those are our instructions. But for them, theirs was much more expansive than we do. It was probably more, if you think about the Last Supper, you know, that Christ had in the upper room with his disciples was more probably a full meal that they actually observed the time of communion. And, 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 and you know, their observance of the Lord's Supper was carried out, you know, so differently than today. Okay, you know, as if they're serving that whole meal. Um, it had gotten so out of hand that it wasn't about the Lord's Supper, it was all about the meal. It was all about, you know, coming together to eat and getting your stomach filled. And in fact, some people would, you know, evidently were, were just eating the supper ahead of time, and others were drinking the drink that was provided was supposed to be a symbol and, and when they came together it wasn't enough for, for anybody else and you know, people were going without. I mean they were totally forgetting the meaning and the purpose of communion. And that's what prompted Paul's statement in verse 7, verse 17. He said, but in giving this instruction I did not praise you because you come together not for the better but for the worse. I mean he was saying literally you're coming together and observing communion the way they were doing it. It was doing them more harm than it was doing them good. So think about this. If we don't come this morning, if our hearts are not right, if our minds aren't focused on what this is supposed to be, this can do us more harm than it could ever do us good. I mean, they're, they're forgetting the meaning as we should not forget the meaning. Our communion, our services, if we don't allow them to make us better, will actually make us worse. If in a few moments when we observe communion, your minds are wandering off. You know, we've done how many times have you had communion in your lifetime? We've done this over and over again. It's easy to get your minds to wander what you got to do this afternoon or something like that. Just going through the motions. If you do that, not only will communion serve you no purpose, you know, going through this ritual here, but it will do your relationship with Christ more harm. If you don't remember your sin, if you're not remembering the great sacrifice that Christ gave for you, if you don't worship and praise Him, you know, over time your heart will be hardened. You can just become apathetic. You know, oh, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And it doesn't mean anything to you. So how do you prepare? How should we be preparing now? For the Lord's Supper. Let me, let me give you some things that we have here in 1 Corinthians 11. Number one, you need to put yourself in the atmosphere of the moment of what was taking place some 2,000 years ago when our Savior, our God, went to the cross to die for us. What was happening at that moment? Put yourself in that atmosphere. I mean, think about that last night about Jesus. You know, Christ knew what was coming. He knew the pain. He knew the suffering of the cross. He knew he was going to be betrayed. He knew his, 
his friends, his disciples, even those who were following him, were going to all abandon him. And he called his disciples together to prepare them for, for what was coming. And instead of verse 23, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. So Paul is saying, I'm, 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 I'm bringing your focus back to the last night you know, in which Jesus was betrayed. When he took the bread. So, so get back to that moment. You know, get back to that, that, that place where Jesus, this all began. You know, for you, for, for, for Jesus dying for you. John chapter 13, verse 1 through 3, it says this. <clears throat> it says it was just before the Passover festival. And Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. Think about that. He loved them to the end. Those who were going to betray him, those who were going to walk away from him, abandon him. He clung on to them. He held on to them. He held on to you. He held on to me. And the evening meal is progressing, and the devil has already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and now he was returning to the Father. We're supposed to remember that. You need to focus your minds and your hearts on that. Second thing, make the purpose of this observation to proclaim Jesus Christ. This is about Jesus here. This is about what he has done for you and for mankind and for your neighbor and for that person at work, for those people that God brings into your path. You know, he is the Messiah that died for mankind. It says it back to 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26. It says, For often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we're doing. Do your mind that you feel like we're coming to communion? And I proclaim that Jesus has died for me. Jesus has died for you. <clears throat> Number three, set your minds upon examining yourself before you partake, while you're partaking. It says in verse 27, it says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man, he should examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat the bread, drink of the cup, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick. Literally, many have died. God has judged them. A number are, are asleep. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. See, it's important for us to examine ourselves before the cross. Remember the price that has been paid for your sins, for my sins. Remember repentance. Examine yourself today, your attitude, your heart, towards sinful behavior. You know, it becomes common to us, but it never is common to God. Examine ourself, you know, next to what Christ has done, the price that he has paid for me, and the Christian life that I'm now living, how I'm following him. You know, hold Christ's life up, hold your life up. You know, are, are they coming together? And the whole purpose of communion is to draw our minds back to the cross. Back to Christ. Back to the forgiveness of your sins. And in that remembrance, to melt us, to humble us, to stir up an appreciation, a resolve, a recommitment to serve. Folks, this is our rallying point. The cross of Jesus Christ. If you're having trouble getting up in the morning and serving Christ, go to the cross. Remember what he has done for you. And get up another day and serve him. If you're having trouble going and, you know, whatever service you're doing for him, you know, whether you're teaching or you're working in the lawn or whatever, if you're having trouble getting excited about that, go to the cross and see what Christ gave for you. And folks, he'll pump you up to be able to give for him, to serve him. This is the rallying point for a Christian, for our Christian lives. Now, I'm going to call the men um, who are going to help us serve. They will come forward right now. And if they would take their place, they can come while I'm talking. I'm going to ask you, um, as we pass out the elements, and we're going to pass them out together, the bread 
and the drink, and we'll, we'll take this communion together. Uh, we practice an open communion, <coughs> meaning that the only requirement for you to take communion, not even for the church here, we just ask that you remember the body of Christ. You are born again believers. This is the time for all believers to come to remember. And we invite you to participate. We're going to hand out the, the cup and the, the, um, the bread together, and then we'll take them together. But while they're being handed out, I mean, put yourself in the atmosphere of the crucifixion. Making it your prayer to proclaim Christ's death, that he died for you, a believer. To other men, that's what communion does. It proclaims to the world. And then examine yourself in the purpose of the moment. Christ died for us. And where are we? That Christ gave his life for our sin. What's our attitude towards our sin?
much I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As our worship team comes forward, I'd like to invite you to pray together. Father, I want to thank you this morning. I needed to remember. My life needed to be centered again around you and what you have done for me to redeem me to yourself. And Lord, let, I hope this not to, to pass quickly. This truth, this feeling, this heartless commitment that I have to you. You know, Satan is going to wear away at it in all of our but Father, I pray that we are constantly brought back to this simple truth that you died for our sins. You died for my sins. Your body was broken. Your blood was shed. And I thank you for that. I thank you my, that my redemption, my salvation is tied up in you. It is not tied up in me and my ability to, to live uh, perfect. But Father, it is tied up into what your Son has done on my behalf. And I pray, Father, that we will go forth with you with such a joy in our heart for what you have done for us that we will tell others that we will proclaim his death, his resurrection to those that we come in contact with. Open our mouths, Father, that we can be, you know, we can be ambassadors for you, ministers, missionaries, to let others know what, what love you have for them. Thank you, Father. In thy son's name. I'm going to invite you to stand together with us.
For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also unto the Gentiles. And Lord, Father, we thank you for reminding us. Father, we thank you for reminding us that it's not about us, it's about you. It's about your Son. It's about your love for us. It's about your death on the cross. And we come here to proclaim that message in our hearts, first of all, into our own lives. But Father, as we go out, Father, you know, to be used of you, we thank you, Father, that we serve a living God. We celebrate your death, but Father, we know that because of your victory over the grave, your victory over sin, ours is eternity, who know you as our Lord and Savior. Ours is, is holiness and righteousness and justification because of what your Son has done upon the cross. And we just come and we thank you. Thank you to be here, to be reminded, Lord, and to be able to carry this message with us. Father, thank you.